Well, good morning. morning. Let's turn to 1 Kings real quick, chapter 8. It's good to be back in the big house. Everybody say big house. Big house. All right. uh, While we were over in the gathering place uh, for several weeks, there was something that I noticed uh, about being in the small perimeters that brought a different level of fellowship, koinonia. That's what fellowship means, koinonia. And so I felt like uh, the Lord showed me something during that time, how important it is. There's half my bubble. Oh, I can't bend over. But uh, anyway, I put some, I've uh, put these ropes back there. I hope you, it doesn't offend anybody. It's simply just to kind of encourage us to come forward. But hopefully we can get, the, get rid of those ropes. Amen. Yeah. And start filling the house up. But uh, Solomon uh, built a house for God. And when it was done, uh, to dedicate it, the first thing they did was Solomon got the elders of the church, the overseers, and they got the ark. He said, go get the ark of God. How I many you know a beautiful building, a beautiful church, is nothing but a big beautiful church unless the ark is in the house. The ark is the very presence of God. So Solomon wisely said, first thing, get the ark in the house. They brought the ark into the house and then they started sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they couldn't even count them all. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place. How I many you know God needs to be the center and, and the ark needs to be the, the presence of God is, needs to be the, the place. Amen? Amen? But how I many you know we got a place inside this this place so we got a building and we need to get but in our hearts we need to get the ark of the covenant in our hearts in this place Uh, because without the holy spirit living inside of me then i'm just i'm a nobody right (laughs) so they got the ark in the house and uh, got the presence of god in the house and all of a sudden the glory of the lord came into the house because of getting the ark in the house and the glory or the very presence and nature of God was so thick that nobody could even stand up. (laughs) Isn't that pretty cool? (laughs) So anyway, we want to start off on the right leg, start off anew and we're in the big house. So first thing we want to do, Big Dave, come on up here. We're going to get the, uh, we're going to recognize the ark's in the house. We've got to recognize the ark being in the house and we're going to start off uh, kind of like in a new direction and get the glory of the Lord in here and start it off right. So, Brother Dave, why don't you go ahead and pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for the provision that you've given us, Father. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, um, I didn't know how we were going to get back in here, Lord. I knew there was a lot of money that needed to be come up with, Father, but you did it, Lord, and you're faithful to us, Lord. So I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for all the families that are here, all the lives that have been changed. <clears throat> Lord, I just ask that you just help us today to uh, listen to Pastor Dave's message and apply it to our heart and our lives. And, but we just want to say thank you for being back in here, Lord, and we just want to worship you right now and give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. So uh, please, everybody, stand up together with me and let's worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. All righty, well, we got our air conditioner all installed just in time when we don't need it. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) 20 tons of AC. I think we started out like $60,000, wasn't it? And God worked it down and worked it down and through Dana and a couple $10,000 donations and uh, got it down to about $16,000. So uh, I can work with that. So let's give the Lord a big hand for that. Also, Damien mentioned next Sunday will be our our potluck fellowship right over here in this back building. And we're going to be having a special pastor, Pastor Mike Grenier. Uh, He's going to be here, a dear friend of mine and a mentor and a true proven man of God, uh, one of God's generals. Glad to have him in my life, but he'll be bringing his recovery ministry uh, over from 
Orlando, Open Homes is their name, so they'll be leading the worship, and we'll probably have another 30 guys here, so why don't we move the ropes next week, and let's pack the house, and uh, bring a lot of food, invite some people, and let's have a, a old glorious shindig, amen? amen. All right, J- Damien Minist, uh, mentioned uh, the Smalling School Kids, and the investment that uh, we've made, how many, when we first started, how many did we, was there? Less than 14 kids, and now how many are there? Close to 100, including uh, college students. Yeah, so I remember I started with a little bitty one. I think she's about six years old, and now she's in college and asking me for money all the time. And <laughs> get out that checkbook. <laughs> she calls me her godfather. <laughs> so, anyway, what an investment, huh? Take a little child that didn't have a daddy and her mom and now she's got two or three kids and uh, but anyway it was an investment so there's a an old saying the the gift that keeps giving so those investments that you make in in smiling school kids is a gift that keeps on giving uh, we're going to be taking up our Christmas offering uh, that's aside from our regular offerings <clears throat> we do this for the next three or four or five weeks probably but I want to talk to you about another investment <clears throat> Definitely a gift that keeps giving. <clears throat> I personally have invested in that child and that family and invested in, uh, I put some money into a sewing machine business and the church, I believe, matched it. That sewing machine business has <laughs> made money and keeps making money and so I'm getting rich on that investment, you know. Uh, you know, we've uh, invested in some pigs uh, we're making some bacon over there these days. So, uh, so with our Christmas offering, <clears throat> we uh, started getting involved in covering a church in, in a Baptist church in Palaquena. We ordained the pastor and uh, Jaime, and that church started <clears throat> with. Uh, we first went there. We couldn't even hardly get to the church. Was it? Uh, we had to get out of the car and push it because the ditches and things and the outhouse. We had to use an outhouse. But anyway, that church. Is evolved now. It's packed out. They've got a regular school. I mean, a huge school now, a radio station, and uh, just uh, helping transform that whole city. About two, two, three years ago, we, they, and we together planted another church up in the, up in the mountains. And uh, this is a, a picture of it right here. Uh, it's a little blurry. I can't pronounce the name of it, but it's uh, way up in the. Uh, way up in the uh, jungle, and uh, it's uh, it's packed out every Sunday now. You know, as soon as the as soon as they build one, they're they're, they're full. Uh, and go ahead and turn the next one. Let's just look at that's the picture there. Uh, the only problem there is they've only got about ten feet on either side of that church, and behind the church is a ravine. <laughs> So they don't really have any property, but they do have just enough in the back uh, to build uh, onto this church to make a youth hall. And so part of the problem on Sunday is the church is packed out, and then they got all these kids, and it's just... Uh... So anyway, uh, let's keep showing a few more pictures there. This is the pastor of the church. Uh, go ahead, next one. This is me praying for the, the leadership with Pastor... Uh, the pastor of uh, uh, Polito and Jaime, and go ahead and go to the next one. That's me going to the bathroom and in the outhouse in the back there. So if you look at that, and there's a couple of the leaders there, but if you look at this picture, the, the ground I'm standing on, go back to that other one, uh, is where we want to get rid of that outhouse and build a bathroom and a youth center. Uh, I forget, I think it's like a 20... 20 by 20, 20 by 25. But anyway, this building can be built for $20,000. And uh, I've already gotten a donation for 5000 And so I'd like this Christmas offering. I'd like to challenge us all to, let's build this, let's build this church. Let's, let's help this church. Okay, a little bit of money over there goes a long way. And I can personally vouch to you that that money is going to be handed to them. <laughs> Nowadays, you give to these other places, and you, ha- you have no idea where the money gets to where it's supposed to be. And 
But we cut through all the red tape and we go there and, and we took some, I think $1,000 or 500 last time. And we weren't even back in town and they were already going into town to buy mortar and bricks and things to help fix the church up. So anyway, it's been a good investment and I want to challenge us over the next few weeks to be praying uh, about raising that $15,000. And uh, uh, because it's an eternal, the kids over there are worth it, aren't they? So anyway, I think this is something that, you know, as a, as a small church that we've invested a lot and done a lot of great things. And, you know, this is one where it's a gift that can't, uh, keeps on giving and it'll come back on us. Amen? All right, let's have our men come forward this morning for our morning offering. Now it's getting hot in here. Turn that AC on. Kick it a little. Brother Bill. Why don't you pray for our offering this morning? Thank you, Jacksonville Jaguar. All righty. Anybody ready to hear something today? I don't have nothing for you. <laughs> Hopefully God does. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 18, I always start every service saying, what is the Spirit saying to the church? At the end of this passage that I'm going to read, at the very end it concludes it. It says in Revelation 2.29 that he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Amplified Version says that he who is able, it means he who has the capacity. If you're a born-again Christian, you have the capacity to hear uh, the voice of God. So if you are able, then you need to be listening. Take heed to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. So what is the Spirit saying to the church today? Also, the church is inside me, isn't it? So, one of the things that I take very, very seriously is spending a lot of time trying to really hear exactly what God says and what God wants me to preach. Uh, many times he wants me, He's asked me to preach things that I'd rather preach other things. <laughs> Things that are more user friendly and uh, and all that, but um, it's important today that we really listen to what God is saying. Uh, you know, this election I believe has uh, revealed a lot of things, and we're in some really difficult times coming. Uh, I'm reading a book now about uh, the uh, last days again and the days of Noah and. Uh, it's bearing witness with what I believe God's telling me. You know, there's so many prophets out there saying that there's going to be a great awakening and a great revival. And, uh, but, and that may be true, but the Bible's very clear that things are going to get worse. Okay, it, it, it's going to get worse. Okay, that's a reality. That's, that's right in the Bible. And I believe that Things are going to get worse, but in the middle of, of that difficult times, I believe that is when the church, if they'll repent and get lined up with God, the, the, the church will prosper. The church has always prospered when persecution happened. You know, when they killed Stephen, everybody took off running. But they ran and dispersed, and then they started preaching where they, they ran to. And so the church proffered. Do we need to turn that up? Is it getting hot in here? So, um, so anyway, I, I believe that we are going to see some supernatural times and some wonderful, glorious times. And for those that have been filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit, we're going to be uh, available and going to be used mightily by God. Uh, so we need to be really listening. Uh, the word I have today was when I started talking a little bit about last week. Going to be called hosting 
Jezebel. How many of you know we can host the Holy Spirit? Uh, but we also, due to unconfessed sin and un lack of repentance, that we also can be open doorways that allow evil spirits to come in and not possess us, you know, but they can begin to influence us. And um, we got to pay attention to what we allow in the pulpit and what we allow in our hearts. But um, we're going to be talking about tolerating evil and the seriousness of of sin. How many know sin dulls the presence of God? Okay. I'll get into that later talking about the hyper uh, grace, prosperity of uh, uh, the false teaching of hyper prosperity. Uh, but we'll get into that later about how we positionally are justified, we're declared in right standing. Uh, God's not holding our sins against us, that's true, but at the same time, experientially sin can affect us y'all hear me people don't preach that there's a position if I died right this minute and you know and I just committed some sin I have no doubt that I'd be in heaven my sins have been cast as far as east to the west and uh, he's not holding my sins against us but at the same time if I go up here and jump off a roof uh, and break my leg uh, you know God forgives me but I still got consequences to live with and just like the prodigal son was still the son's father and there was no change in that, he went off on his own and got into some experiences and things that, and sin that, uh, that interfered with who he was. And the same thing too. We can be born again Christians. We can be of the Father. But at the same time, because we have free choices, we can do whatever we want. So it's, it's, it's okay to sin. Are you with me? But it's not okay to sin. Okay, it's okay to sin in the sense that praise God... I've got an advocate with the Father that if I sin, then I can go to Him and He cleans up my mess. Uh, but it's not okay to sin because sin affects my relationship with God. You know, uh, a man may be watching pornography at night. <laughs> you know, uh, his wife may forgive him and do all that. But, but, but trust me, if, you, if a man is allowing that to happen in his house and a woman, she's not, that's going to affect the relationship. Okay, it, it's going to hurt the house. It's going to hurt the relationship if she knows what's going on. So positionally, that's her husband and he's the head of the house. But if he chooses, it's going to hurt the relationship. So sin uh, needs to be talked about a little bit. Not a lot, but anyway. He, uh, John is on the island of Patmos. He gets caught up basically and begins to get revelations and messages for the churches. There are seven churches. And these letters are basically uh, uh, what I've been told, and I believe it's accurate, that they're talking, that the, they're talking to the church, but primarily the focus is to the pastor, who's the one responsible. When God addresses a household, he's going to confront the man first, right? When God deals with the church, he's going to confront the pastor. He's the pastor's, I'm responsible for what goes through that door. <laughs> What comes in here, and I'm responsible for who stands up here. And so, anyway, the church at Thyatira. I want to talk about the performance appraisal or the review. When I worked for Florida Power and Light for years, one of the big things uh, somewhere in the year usually was everybody was called into the office. Everybody had an appointment, and you came in and <laughs> with fear and trembling, and you you were going to hear the truth. Uh, you're going to hear all the good things you're doing, but then they're going to point out the bad things you're doing or the areas that you need to improve on. Not that it's necessarily bad, but uh, just the areas. Get me getting hot in here. So, we're going to look at uh, the performance appraisal for the church. And how uh, I many know a wise man looks at his weaknesses? Okay, I already know the things I do good. <laughs> I got no problem with that. <laughs> what I need to be focusing on those areas that are undealt with or unrepented or areas that affect my relationship with God. That's I need to focus on my my weaknesses. Okay, if I'm smart and I'm wise. Okay, 
And so it says that the angel of the church, I got to do some studying on that, but apparently there was an angel assigned to this church, in particular Thyatira. And he's addressing to the angel, uh, I want you to write these things about. There's been a performance appraisal. We've prepared ahead of time. Whenever I went into my performance appraisal, they were already evaluated. They already did the calculate. They already had everything, and basically it was a done did deal. This is what you're going to get in raise, or you're not going to get. And it was already determined. They would spend time with it. So this has already been done, and now it's time to let the church know how you're doing. You know, how, how, how does your review? What's good and what's bad? Like I say, it's important to know what's good, but it's even more important to know what's bad. So he says to the angel of the church in Thyatira, the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. This is the word. I know your deeds. I'm not confused. I'm not perplexed. I know exactly how you've done in the last year, for example. I know your deeds, I recognize your love, and your faith, and your servants, and your perseverance. If I was listening to that letter, I'd be kind of getting pumped up already. Say, hey, I ain't doing so bad. I'm going to get a big raise. <laughs> and that your deeds of late have been greater than the first. I see it getting better and better. You're even improving. Wow, that's really good. But then he says, but... Everybody circle the word but. I like to hear the good stuff, but no one wants to hear the buts. The attaboys. He says, but I have this one thing against you, one area that you're not excelling in, you're not dealing with, you're not growing in, and this is the area that I need you to focus on that you're not doing. If you really want to be successful, then you would want to, to know that. People today are so scared of the truth. They don't really want to know, you know. But if you really want to grow and you really want to change, then you should want to know your character. You should want to know the areas uh, that you need to improve in. But I have this against you, that you tolerate and you allow the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they will commit acts of immorality, eating things, sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent, but she does not want to. She's shown no interest in taking any ownership of her stuff. She's not listening to the, the Spirit, that's for sure. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery. So I'm going to throw, there's going to be consequences for her and for those who follow her. Those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent, unless they change their mind, their attitude, and the direction, and repent, repent of this. I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. I am he who does a searching and fearless moral inventory. What's going on in your mind? What's going on in your heart? I am the one that is constantly doing a performance appraisal on you, and I will give to each one of you uh, 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 recompense based on how you're doing. You'll get your reward based on how well you respond to this correction. So this woman, Jezebel, was uh, a person, apparently. And for whatever reason, the pastor was allowing her to be in the pulpit. Okay. Uh, I got no problem with women teaching or even being pastors to some degree or whatever but I uh, but I believe the Bible the principle basically is that a woman needs to be under a man's authority so if a man if a pastor is a senior pastor and he allows someone here then uh, then I believe it's okay as long as uh, yeah, but he's going to answer for it 
So apparently this pastor of the church is not getting it. He ain't seeing it. He ain't hearing what he's, he's not spending time really listening. And for whatever reason, uh, he's been allowing this woman, maybe because it's bringing people in and bringing money in or whatever, uh, or maybe he doesn't even realize it, who she really, really is, and he's not really discerning accurately or testing the spirits, and he's allowing this woman to sit up here and teach, and her teachings, what's coming out, is leading people astray. Taking them away. It's, the word is beguiled. If you look at, don't go there, just listen to me, 2 Corinthians 11 says that Paul's addressing the church, he says, I'm jealous with you. He's talking to his church in Corinth. But it's a godly jealousy because I betrothed you to one husband, that is to Christ, that you might present yourself as a pure virgin. But I am afraid and I am concerned that just like the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your minds will be led astray, swept away, deluded, deceived from the simplicity and purity of devotion with Christ. Adam and Eve had a pure, perfect, simple life, uh, relationship. And they were told that uh, they could enjoy that, but if they sinned, that relationship would be severed. So the devil's goal was to lead them astray, away from Christ, to get them away from that relationship, cause them to sin, and then they would be excommunicated. The word is beguiled. So the devil, you know, probably came in and... Uh, you know, sir, say, has God said? Has God really said? Is that what God really meant when He said, don't eat of this tree and don't do this? And, and He began to twist things, pervert things, and He got into her head and began to confuse her. And hear her pastor, her head, Adam, who was there with her, <laughs> It wasn't, like Adam, uh, it wasn't like Adam was out working in the, in the garage watching football or something. No, it says he was with her. That means elbow to elbow. That means he was sitting right here standing next to his wife watching her go through this dialogue for the devil and he said nothing. He just let her carry on for whatever reason and the devil uh, caused them both to do that. So this Jezebel spirit is probably not... Uh, the way we get this thing is, is uh, it's, a, it's not a person. It could be a man or a woman or whatever, but it's usually a spirit. For whatever reason, that wiggles its way into the church. And it's not going to come in and stand up here with a red suit on and a pitchfork and say, I'm the devil. No, it's going to come up here uh, uh, and it's going to look like a sheep, but it's really going to be a wolf with sheep in clo uh, sheep's clothing. Disguised as an angel of light. So apparently for whatever reason, this woman Jezebel had some areas of her life that were unresolved, undealt with, unrepented of, uh, where these demonic spirits are on the outside, could work their way into the church and get into her and not only deceive the pastor, but she probably didn't even know it herself. Who knows? But either way, it brought corruption and perversion and Next thing you know, her teachings were bringing confusion between the people and it was leading them astray from the truth. Causing them to get into sexual immorality and all kinds of things. And then he says, I have given her time to repent. I've been talking to her. I've been speaking to her. She needs to repent, but pastor's not doing nothing. Nobody's saying nothing. Uh... They're just sitting there watching people be led astray and uh, going out into the world and watching this thing go on and nobody's saying a word. He says, well, tell that angel, God sends that angel and says, write this and tell them this, that, that there's a, that woman Jezebel uh, has a bad spirit on her. She's hosting a Jezebel spirit, which is to undermine Christ. It's an anti-Christ spirit, a spirit of lawlessness. The spirit of lawlessness is being held back now. But it's at work, and our prayers and the, the remnant are holding back. But there's going to come a time when there's going to be a stepping away and God removing His hand, and there's going to be a spirit of lawlessness that just takes over completely. And then we're talking mass corruption. So the Jezebel spirit is, is, to, is to undermine Christ, undermine truth. It's to castrate and to intimidate people to get Him to back off. The pastor steps up in boldness and... 
you know, that's why y'all need to pray for me. When I start speaking some of these messages, man, all kinds of things start happening. So when I step up boldly, you can count on the Jezebel spirit trying to shut my mouth, trying to castrate me, trying to intimidate me, trying to send my, work on my insecurities and things or whatever, you know, to get me to go over here and to lead me astray from God and get over here and self-pity and say, poor little old me, and I guess I shouldn't preach those things anymore. People are lying about me. And, well, I mean... When you're over the target and you're preaching what you need to be, you can expect the devil to come on up out. If I'm not, ra if I'm not rattling you today, <laughs> and I'm not making a few people mad, and uh, everything I say is, uh, uh, is, 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 is getting good applause, but you know, no, no uh, opposition, then I'm probably not preaching the truth. <laughs> so he says, I've given this woman time to repent. The pastor hadn't done nothing. Nobody... Her, her ladies group hasn't done nothing. Nobody said nothing. Her husband hasn't said anything. I've given her time to her, but she doesn't want nothing to do with it. Her intention is to carry on. She is a self-proclaimed prophetess. You know, so one of the biggest things you need to watch for when someone claims to be a prophet is a prophetess. Say, who's your pastor? What church do you go to? Are you under authority? So she was self-proclaimed. I mean, she proclaimed to be ordained. She proclaimed to be... Uh, uh, a prophetess that speaks on behalf of God, but, but she wasn't anointed by God. She had everybody convinced. And this is what you got to watch. These people that get these, you're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to see sermons come out of people. You're going to see all kinds of works and different things. And if you're not testing the spirits and you're not praying, you'll be deluded and deceived just like these people. A deceived person doesn't know they're deceived. And if the pastor can be deceived and he not recognize it, then how much more is everybody else? going to be deceived so I've given her time to repent but she shows no interest uh, I will throw her on a bed of sickness commit adultery and though and those who commit adultery with her that are in on this unless they repent of their deeds so I mean no oh God is patient second Peter 3 9 says the Lord does not delay is not tardy or slow about his promises according to some people conception of slowlessness but he is long-suffering extraordinarily patient towards you not desiring that any should perish but that all uh, should turn in repentance there's already in the works and there's it's going to get worse there's there's going to be a a judgment coming okay First uh, Peter four seventeen, I believe, says that uh, that judgment, the time of judgment, has begun, and it's going to start with the household of God. It begins with us first, and if it begins with us first, and God, what's going to become of the people that aren't even seeking God? <laughs> so I believe there's already a judgment that's passed a lot of the world. Doesn't mean they still don't have time and to get in, but I believe we're way past that. I believe God. Because of the times we're in and where we're headed, God is wanting a pure church. God is wanting a pure, spotless bride. He needs to get rid of the false prophets. He needs to get rid of the false teachers. He needs to get rid of the Jezebel spirits. He needs to clean the house. God needs to go into the church uh, and get those things out that are being tolerated. The things that are tolerated in the church and the things that are being tolerated in my life. And there's uh, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and, and if they don't repent, then, then God's going to bring in the tree cutters. He's given these people time to repent. He's been patient, he's been kind, but God is getting ready to expose a lot of this false stuff. So I don't know, but I don't want to be one of them. And I don't want you to be one of them. So I'm the shepherd, I'm the pastor, I'm the one responsible for the church, and, you know, and, and it's my job to watch what goes into that door. Whether we have 30 people or 300 people, it's my job to know what's going on here, and the church needs to, to repent. They need to take a good look at the, the stuff that's going on in the church. One of the things that uh, God is, is uh, concerned about is the Bible. I've told you before that... Forty-some percent of all senior pastors now no longer believe that this is the inspired Word of God. It's just a book with good rules. Forty-five percent of senior pastors, if that's true, 
and they don't believe that, then they're, they're not going to be teaching the full counsel of God. <laughs> they're not going to be ready in season and out of season to teach, rebuke, correct, and train. <laughs> you know, and so one of the things that, that God's going to judge is what's coming out of this pulpit. And we need to be preaching God's righteousness, God's moral code, God's moral standard. We need to be expository dividing the Word. Because I'm here to tell you, if you look out there today, they, they're not preaching. <laughs> they throw one little scripture out and then they talk for an hour. But the church doesn't even know the Bible, the Word of God, because the pastors aren't focusing on preaching the Gospel. Worship up here sometimes. I've even heard of Churches not being able to get a worship leader, so they go out and hire someone that's very talented, but they're not even a Christian to lead worship. Is that crazy or what? Here they are smoking pot on Saturday night and doing all their different things, and they come up and it's more of a concert than it is a worship time. My brothers and sisters, things ought not be that way. Someone needs to protect the pulpit. Someone needs to step up and discern and test the Spirit. Somebody needs to be holding people accountable. We need to deal with sin in the church. We need to deal with people that are living together and uh, committing different things. My policy is that you're welcome to come to this church. If you come to this church, you're welcome. I don't care if you're drinking or drugging as long as you're not dis, uh, dis disruptive. But there comes a point when you begin to come forward and begin to want to work in the nursery and want to become a member, and you want to start doing some different things, then, then it's my job to step in and, and do, a, do an evaluation on them. Find out. Who are you? Where did you come from? People come to the, to the program and uh, want to lead worship and do things. And I say, well, where did you come from? Uh, let me, what church? Oh, I went to this church. Do you care if I call your pastor? You know, you want me to, and then you'd be surprised how many of them. Church conduct, you know. People coming in today, like I say, having rock concerts, and I noticed one church was even having an open bar before church. Come in and they actually serving cocktails, I heard. Okay. Girls coming in dressed seductively. Luring people away while they're supposed to be listening to the pastor. The guys are turning their heads and they're looking at this girl and being allowed. Children just running around in church and there's no uh, discipline. And uh, I mean, these, these are things that uh, we shouldn't be allowing church. I went to, uh, I can't remember if it was the Dominican Republic. And I went into this old Baptist church and... People, first thing they do when they come into church is they come and hit their knees and start praying. I mean, kids, right on up, just start praying. Then they go back and take a seat. Women are on this side wearing dresses. Kids sitting up front. Men on this side wearing ties and suits. And, you know, they're not running around sunglasses and all these crazy, crazy different things. And in one church, there actually was a lady in the back with a switch. It was watching the kids in the back and she was smacking them the whole service, you know So I'm kind of old school, but either way there's there's conduct a behavior There's things behaviors and things that we as a church need to be confronted So Revelations 2 29 says that he who has ears to hear let him listen let him hear what happened? So I don't know what happened to the church at Thyatira. I don't know if they corrected their mess and turned it around. But either way, they were given time to repent. And apparently at the moment, they had not been hearing it from God. So they needed to be told it for other people. Turn now to 1 Corinthians 5. Good to see my friend Bob Ross back there and his beautiful wife. Uh, me and Bob went to high school. He was, he was good at football. <laughs> I wasn't good at any of that stuff. I was voted biggest flirt and teacher torment. That's what I was voted. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit today about tolerating sin and the seriousness of it. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 5, 1-5, through 5, the church in Corinth was very sexually promiscuous and they had love feats and people were getting saved, things were happening, but they were still 
allowing a lot of things to go on in the church that God was not happy about, that no one was confronting. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. Verse 1 says, It has actually been reported to me. Paul planted this church. He moved on. Uh, for whatever reason, he got word from people that, hey, let me tell you what's going on at your church that you planted, and it ain't good. Uh, I'm bringing you a performance appraisal. I'm giving you a report on, on how your church is doing. And Paul, a pastor's heart ra 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 raises up in him, and he says, he says man, I'm, that's, that's not good. That's not okay. I'm responsible for that church plan. It's actually reported to me, and I hear word that there's sexual immorality that is going on right in your church. Impurity of such a kind that is should be condemned, and it doesn't even convert. Con, it's it's more serious than even what's going on out there in the world. That's some pretty bad sexual immorality. So apparently, it was rampant in the church. You know, worshiping God, doing this, but yet they're having all kinds of sexual sins and different things going on, whatever they might be. And it's been reported to me that a man has been sleeping with his father's wife. We're talking about incest. <laughs> Apparently the son, the son was coming to church and the father was coming to church. The wife was sitting here and all the time there was an affair going on behind the scenes where his son was sleeping with his wife. And you are proud and arrogant, and you ought to rather mourn, but in sorrow and in shame, until the person who has done this shameful thing is removed from your fellowship. That means to be excommunicated, voted off the island. I've been around a long time, and I've only seen one church, actually, that I know of, that I was there, stand up and publicly dismiss somebody from being a part of the church. They were confronted, it was done right, they didn't do it, it was a sexual affair, and they basically stood up and said, this person is no longer welcome in our church, and he's off the roll. Ordained ministers that are ordained, that are, that are not walking out things with God now, are supposed to be found out, run down and found out what you're doing, why you're not doing, you've been an ordained minister, why are you, not, why are you doing this, and, and if not, they need to be defrocked, is what it's called. I know people that have been ordained and running around out there, and they've never, no one's ever gone back to them. I, I, I personally defrocked someone that we ordained right here. And they didn't, a lot of people didn't think too highly of that or whatever, but this person got ordained up here, said they were going to do all this. They never did it. Matter of fact, they basically were using for years and years and years and were lying to me, and I should have, it was my fault. I should have gone a long time ago and found out what's happening with this guy. Uh, but you know, uh, anyway, the Lord told me he needs to be removed. He needs to have that taken away. It doesn't mean that he can't be, repent and turn it around again. And I ran into this person later on and we're good. He said, you did the right thing. <laughs> you know, uh, kind of thanked me for it. But anyway, they weren't, uh, they weren't dealing with this. You are to deliver this man over to Satan <laughs> for physical discipline so that not that we can get rid of him, but so that he'll repent. So that we can deal with these and destroy these carnal lusts which have prompted him to commit this evil sin. What are the things that are really going on in his heart and his spirit that caused him to do that? That's what we want to get to, the root of the problem. That his spirit may be saved in the long run. About this condition of where you're really at. It is not good. Uh, and then he goes on and says, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Some of you ladies understand this, but when you're cooking a loaf of unleavened bread, you can't get even one little speck of yeast in it. Because if you allow one speck of yeast, it'll begin to influence and change the nature of it. And now it becomes... Leavened bread versus unleavened bread. It was very important that when the priests wanted unleavened bread, it needed to be free of contamination or corruption or anything. So Paul says you need to get this sin in particular. You need to deal with it. You need to confront it. You need to get it out of the church because it is a yeast. It is a sin that's going on that is influencing and infecting the whole church. And how many of the pastors are responsible for that? 
So Paul says, I don't, you know, I'm telling you all you need to deal with it, but when I come down there, I'm going to deal with it. And we're going to correct this thing, and we're going to get God's church back in order. So he says a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. One little sin, no matter how little it is, the Bible says, catch the little foxes that are spoiling your vineyard. There's little sins that we allow that are unconfessed, that are deceitful, that are going on in our lives, uh, that are spoiling our, our vineyard, our heart. And we have to catch those little rascals. One little sin uh, can affect the whole body. Someone is diagnosed with cancer. Uh, they have to get every single little cell. So to do that, they have to go above and beyond the actual cells to go bigger than what they really need to make sure there's no chance of it recurring because they know that one little bit of cell left can cause them to be right back in here again. My mother had a double mastectomy. It was only one side. But they said to be safe so that you'll never deal with this, just do a double mastectomy and get rid of it and be done with. It's serious. It's going to cost you. It's going to take you out. So let's, let's bite the bullet. So when we allow sin and different things in the church, it begins to influence everybody just like this Jezebel lady was doing. If you remember in Acts chapter 4 or 5, the church was growing big. Things were happening. All of a sudden the people began to sell their property. And they would bring the proceeds in, sell their whatever and they were bringing all this money into the church and piling it in front of the preacher and then the preacher would take it and re redistribute it to everybody as had need need what a purity you know what a great thing going on in the house of god can you, can you imagine that happening today be the way things were going so good and all of a sudden uh, this couple named Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira brought some money and apparently it was only half of what uh, God had told them to give. Somehow the pastor, because he's spending time with God, which was Peter, got a word of knowledge. He was testing the spirits or whatever. He says, hey, hey, hey. And he confronted the husband because the wife wasn't even there and says, hey, why is it, what, what is going, why are you lying against the Holy Spirit? He's like, what? What are you talking about? What do you mean? He goes, well, didn't you bring this much money and did you not agree and he said yeah well then why did you only bring half of it why is this evil deed why are you why are you tolerating this in your life this deception uh, uh, why are you lying to the holy spirit i don't know if he had time to repent or whatever but we know that he fell down dead <laughs> and they took him out and buried him 20 minutes later or something the wife comes in they didn't let her know what was happening. They said, oh, by the way, you know, what was the amount of money? And she said, oh, it was this, this, and this. And she lied. Peter said, hey, uh, they just took your husband out for lying. It's that serious. And he's buried out there. And they're getting ready to take you and bury you too. And she fell down dead. Now, that sounds like pretty harsh, doesn't it? How many of you remember the guy named Yuza that uh, was responsible for holding the ark on the, on, in the cart? And no one was supposed to touch the ark. But it started falling and he reached out to stable it. And he fell down dead. David was so freaked out over the seriousness of violating God's standards that you know, he got rid of the ark for a while. He said, oh, get that thing out of here. It's, it's bad news. So anywhere, God, uh, so you think about why did God take that? So the church was about to blossom. It was prospering. You know? And God was trying to send a message early about the seriousness of, of lying to the Holy Spirit and deceitfulness. He wanted it caught up. He, he knew that a little leaven would leaven the whole lump. And the Holy Spirit said, confront that, deal with that. And here two of them ended up being dead. Do you think that hit the, hit the news all around town? Now what if Peter had not done what God told him to? What if he hadn't confronted it? What if he had allowed it to go on? I don't think it would have turned out good for him, would it? And it could have hurt the whole church. John chapter 2. It 
So a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. So if you don't want sin to affect and influence your heart, then you need to catch those little foxes before they start causing serious problems in your relationship with God. We'll talk about that more later on. But in John chapter 2, Jesus shows up in town. The Passover is here. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he went into the temple. Let's go in and do a little look around. Let's do a searching and fearless, fearless moral inventory. Let's do a performance appraisal. Let's see what's going on in the house, the big house. So he goes into the big house and, uh, and it says he found in the temple... Those who were selling auction sheep and doves and money changers were seated there with their tables. <laughs> and he made a scourge of whip, of cords, a whip, and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep, the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things out of my father's house. Quit making it a place of business. And he said this, for zeal for my father's house has consumed me. Jesus went in on a Sunday morning and he saw a flea market going on. He saw people overselling the sheep and the lambs because it was Passover, extorting them, raising the prices, wheeling and dealing. And it was basically a, like a casino in Las Vegas. Jesus' holy anger got really mad about the corruption and the sin, the things that were going on, and he got up his belt. <laughs> and he went in and started cleaning house, baby. Knocking over tables, causing a ruckus. <laughs> I bet he won friends and influenced people that day, didn't he? They probably wouldn't even ever let him back in the church. But either way, a, a holy zeal came up. And he began to drive out those things in the church that did not look like what God wanted. Basically, confronting. So we as pastors and clergy, we need to uh, go into the church. Take ownership and deal with some of the things that aren't going. But more importantly, uh, is the individual heart. There's things in my life that... I've overturned some tables, I've had some victories, but then there's some tables that <laughs> I just can't quite turn over. Some it took me a while and I turned them over. But either way, I've finally gotten to the point in my life now where I believe I've turned over the majority of the, of the tables in my heart and the lies and the sins and I've driven out and taken responsibility and repented. So before God can deal with the big house, He has to deal with this house. So I wrap all this up to say, everybody close their eyes today. Hebrews said, let, let us therefore lay aside every sin, every encumbrance, and the, so, the sins that so easily entangled us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Let us take ownership, repent, let us lay aside or strip off, throw aside all encumbrances, all stumbling blocks, all things that impede and interfere uh, with our jour spiritual journeys every unnecessary weight, weight, anything that clings to us and entangles us and interferes and let us run with patient endurance the race set before us. We're all in a race. We're all headed to heaven. Uh, and it's time for us to get serious and clean house. So this altar is open today. Maybe you've got some areas of your life that you need to drive out that you're not taking ownership of. So this altar is open if you want to come today. Amen. Hope you've had enjoyed the service today. And uh, Lord, we just want to thank you and bless you and praise you, Lord. Lord, do a searching, fearless, moral inventory in our heart, Lord, and let your kindness lead us to repentance, Lord. And as we go out there, Lord, into the world, protect and watch over us and let our light shine before men. Bless us coming and going. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. See ya!